I'm going to talk about the Filecoin, the largest type of fast deployment. Right after me, uh, you'll hear about Lotus, one of the implementations of Filecoin uh, from Ayush. Uh, I'm going to talk about three parts. I'm going to give it a quick intro, use cases and scale. Uh, I want to talk about the Filecoin architecture, the broader system architecture, so you get a sense of how all the different components um, uh, operate. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some sets of problems around retrieval, interop, um, indexers, and computation. Uh, so uh, I've given a lot of talks about this, but you can, you know, in a summary, Falcon is a crypto-powered storage network. Um, it's blockchain-coordinated storage market. So think of using a blockchain to um, advertise storage providers and advertise retrieval providers, um, advertise clients, and so on, and be able to um, coordinate operation. Uh, the network verifies storage using zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, it's the largest NARC system, I think, to date. Um, yeah, I, think, I don't think anything uh, has surpassed it yet. Um, it is a. It uses proofs of replication and proofs of spacetime, uh, some deep um, cryptographic primitives that are not primitives, constructions based on other primitives and so on um, that we ended up using and having to create and then and then use. Uh, this is the stats of the network. So there's about uh, 17 exabytes of storage capacity. Um, there's about so there's about 4,000 storage providers. It's about 400 organizations and lots of projects and so on. Um, yeah, so the, the to get a sense of the capacity, most of the facilities are large-scale um, cloud-style data centers. Uh, so you can think of a lot of data centers in cities all around the world um, with very large racks um, of capacity, and that capacity right now is actual arranged. Um, bits um, that ha that are being proved at all times, so that we know in every 24 hours that all of that capacity and all of the data that's stored, I'll, I'll show the data in a moment, um, are proved every 24 hours, so we know that that capacity is there. Uh, by the way, the blockchain and all of that is in IPLD, so um, it's using Seabor, and it's, uh, so it's a totally IPFS native blockchain system. Uh, this is the capacity. Uh, this is the capacity growth, um, and this is the data onboarding. So it's onboarding on the on the order of 0.5 to one petabyte a day, and so that's a lot of data. So um, we went from Kubo to Lotus, where Kubo was like, you know, at the beginning for dealing with megabytes and gigabytes and like ah, making its way to terabytes and like finally made it, and then Lotus is like, bam, <laughs> petabytes, exabytes. Um, now, of course, it's not ex petabytes or exabytes in data distribution that's in capacity, and it ends up dealing with like all of the storage outside. So one extremely big difference between all the Falcon implementations and um, Kubo and other uh, prior IPFS implementations is that the data size is so big that you have to do a lot of stuff outside of any kind of um, DAG manipulation or outside of like one nice DAG store or something like that. Um, the data is coming out to Falcon through a set of on ramps and uh, uh, Falcon Plus, which is an incentive structure. Um, the web to use cases are things like data sets, public, um, think of large scale public archives, um, different kinds of um, computational data, and so on. Um, and more, most recently, it's been uh, starting to get used by large institutions that have massive scale data sets. So think of tens to hundreds of petabytes a pop. Um, by the way, this is like super fascinating data to onboard into a network and then enable with computation. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, there's a lot of native Web3 use cases, so things like um, consumer storage, video and audio, NFTs and Web3 storage and so on. Uh, all of those have um, tens of thousands of users, like developers, and generating like millions of, tens of millions of objects and so on. Um, I think getting to on the order of 100 million. Um, but all of that stuff is tiny. So all of the Web3 objects is very, very small. So Falcon has to immediately turn to like Web2 use cases because all of the Web3 data just doesn't, just doesn't add up to, to be very meaningful. Now, Falcon still has to operate really well for all the Web3 use cases because that's where a lot of the Web3 applications are. Uh, so it has to do both, like 
do really well for um, being the underlying um, data store for those Web3 use cases and um, start pulling large-scale um, Web2 things. Where it's headed is to enable large-scale Web3 applications. So this is what needs to happen in order for Web3 to cross the chasm. We need to be able to deal with, we need to be able to build things like all the applications on the left um, using um, Web3 primitives. So things like IPFS, things like uh, blockchains and whatnot. Uh, it's a long road to get here. Uh, the big kind of like next big blocker is things like data pipelines and consensus scalability and so on. Um, and there's a lot of kind of direction into um, computation that Falcon is taking. So things like F um, Falcon added the FEM, which is a WASM based um, uh, virtual machine. The, the upgrade just went live earlier this week. Sorry, last week? I think last week. Um, uh, and that is going to enable a bunch of different runtimes to be added on top. So think of being able to add the EVM or Agoric um, SES or things like that, um, Swing Set and whatnot, and a bunch of other uh, other systems. Or target Wasm directly uh, through some some other kind of Wasm native runtime. Um, from there, by having smart contracts and that kind of computational layer, you then can do scheduling for large scale computational networks. So think of uh, Lambda and EC2 and containers and VMs and so on. And like all of that becomes possible once you can schedule. Um, and so we think that uh, Falcon is going to be really useful for compute networks. So think of Falcon as a really good L1 for, for a bunch of L2s um, that build around the fact that all the storage providers have a massive amount of hardware for both storage and computation. So they have a bunch of disks and a bunch of GPUs, and they have a bunch of the data, so you want to move the functions over there, compute on it, and so on. And by the way, content addressing and all the IPFS stuff like makes this kind of thing possible and makes it shine. Um, one reason that there's going to be many computational networks is that cryptographic primitives are very different, and so they yield different rational, um, different economic structures for getting verifiability and very different performance profiles. So it's unlikely that we'll see one single computational network. We'll see probably many um, uh, for a while. Uh, it'll take a while for these to kind of synthesize. There's a bunch of next-gen scalability uh, that needs to happen. Um, uh, there's, this is what the Consensus Lab group is working on. Um, and kind of like the, the, the goal is to get to billions of transactions per second or trillions of transactions per second through things like um, applying hierarchical consensus and, and so on. Uh, but we really want to get to like blockchains that have very fast finality, think like millisecond finality. Uh, so within a data center. So that means you, you're never going, you, you have a blockchain that can operate within a region and then stamp up. Um, great, so let's talk about IP, uh, IPFS. So uh, Falcon is an IPFS system. At the end of the day, the entire um, blockchain is IPLD data. All of the sectors um, are IPLD data. The data within the sectors are IPLD data. All of this stuff is, is, um, <clears throat> is, IP, uh, is IPFS stuff. Um, and the transfer protocols are IPFS-oriented protocols. Um, but Lotus started in a different direction. Lotus and GoFalcon, which turned into Venus, um, started in a different direction, not from Kubo, using a lot of the libraries from Kubo, but then starting from scratch. And so that yielded a bunch of like interrupt gaps between the two that have just been the bane of a, a lot of our existence, where like, Kubo does a certain th set of things, Lotus did a certain set of things, and just kind of like being able to bridge between the two has been uh, non-trivial. Um, but anyway, this is the, the rough architecture where you have source clients bringing in data through on-ramps into source providers, then data being um, indexed there, and those indexes, that data being advertised to these ind indices. Uh, and then when clients want to retrieve the data, they kind of either go directly to a retrieval provider or check the index for, for some data. Uh, the index here is not just the DHT. The DHT is uh, not going to scale for <laughs> petabytes of, for hundreds of petabytes of stuff. So we really need um, much more scalable content routers. Uh, that's what the whole session tomorrow is about. It's about very scalable um, content routing systems. And you, you basically need O of one um, network accesses to be able to like, do this with very large indices. And you need decentralization, which is tricky. Uh, but basically, you don't want to do something like Kademlia because then you end up like with a bunch of hops 
and you end up like advertising petabytes of stuff into, into the DHC. Uh, Falcon has a bunch of different consensus nodes um, and storage provider nodes, uh, Lotus, Venus, Forest, and Wuhan. Um, this is from blockchain client diversity requirements, where you want separate independent code bases to make sure that like, if you get into some problems with one, um, other nodes in the network can potentially carry on. Um, I found this table. I don't know if it's up to date, but this is a table that like implies where, where things are. Um, and you'll hear about Lotus in a moment. Uh, there's other uh, programs and other uh, nodes. So think of Boost is a uh, layer that gets added to things like Lotus and other uh, nodes that can do storage and retrieval for a source writer. Uh, and think of it as kind of like an interrupt layer and a bunch of added tools and, and, and um, systems to be able to mediate the client and storage provider deal making of like, oh, I want to retrieve this thing and I want to pay you, or hey, I want you to take this data and like store it. Once you start moving around large amounts of data, like tens of gigabytes or terabytes, you have to deal with like all kinds of scheduling problems and so on. Um, and especially when you have some computation that you are going to run in the background, like ceiling. Uh, and so that's where things like Boost uh, come in. There's another um, implementation called Estuary, which we'll also hear about uh, later today, uh, I think. And that's, I uh, think of that as an IPFS implementation tuned for medium scale data onboarding into Falcon. So this is like 10 gigabytes to a petabyte. Uh, so it's not, it can't handle like 10 petabytes plus. Uh, at that point, you want to move things outside of the wire. You just don't want to use the internet. Um, but 10 gigabytes to a petabyte is uh, the sweet, sweet spot for, for Estuary. And think of Estuary as like a, an intermediate node between clients and, and source providers. Uh, Falcon nodes are IPFS nodes. So think of this diagram where like, the Lib2P network is a very large network. Um, IPFS is, a, is on top of that, and Falcon is a subset of, that, of the IPFS network. Um, it's IPLD, Lib2P, and UnixFS all the way down. Um, all the blockchain data is IPLD data, and so on. Files today are imported, like regular um, POSIX files are imported as UnixFS. Maybe they should be WinFS. Um, the transports today are BitSwap and GraphSync, and the network is Lib2P, HTTP, or offline. Uh, so there's a lot of offline movement of data because these scales, you just, you, you can't use the internet. Um, so one important thing, uh, there's a lot of people always talk about Falcon and IPFS interop, but that's a misnomer. It's like, think of like Lotus and Kubo interop. And part of what led to this was that people were calling Lotus Falcon and people were calling uh, Go IPFS IPFS. And so like, we have to like undo this conceptual damage. So I'm just gonna let that stay for a moment. <laughs> Burn it into your mind. Um, so that's a good one. Um, and it, Falcon was sort of um, designed uh, to have all these like different components um, that are meant to compose when you want to create a node. Uh, so think of a consensus node as having a set of libraries. It has a, a lib2p node, a, a local repository, some local notion of time, and a bunch of facilities for the blockchain. Um, think of a storage mining node as having all of that plus the ability to deal with files, and the ability to do the storage mining components. Um, think of a storage provider as like all of that, plus the ability to um, make deals and, and participate in the storage market. And think of, of a retrieval provider node as not having to maintain the blockchain state at all. It's just, a, it's just another node and a client and doesn't have to um, uh, check in with consensus. That's in theory. So that's the theory of the protocols, and, and the protocols allow that kind of thing. In practice, the implementations are a lot murkier and the libraries are not um, as easily um, uh, decoupled and so on because when you're making a thing, you, like, you encounter all kinds of different constraints that are different than the, like, the theoretical constraints. So um, it's not as easy as like plug and play to making these things. These end up being like totally different code bases. Um, the, so some quick notes on retrieval, interop, indexers. Um, Actually, let me check time. I think this is a useless slot now. So yeah, so I'll, I'll couple comments and then I'll, I'll hop off. So on retrieval, um, so the whole storage flow is working pretty well now. The retrieval flow is not working very well yet. Um, we're right now. This is where, why we made um, an indexer service that can index all of the stuff that the storage providers have, can ingest that into like one place and then make that accessible. So like that's live now. Um, that's getting connected to the um, IPFS gateway. Uh, you'll probably hear about that tomorrow. Um, and then we want retrieval provider networks 
to be able to kind of use that indexing information and then pull data from storage providers. Those retail provider networks are being tested right now. Those are getting built uh, at the moment. There's, there's no, like, there are some test nets live that, that work and are trying to raise the gateway and so on, um, but they're not kind of um, uh, good enough yet to like make that retrieval flow work well. So today, like, you can ease, like, relatively easily write your data into into Filecoin depending on you know how big it is. Um, if it's big, it's going to be harder. If it's small, it's very easy um, using many of the on ramps. Uh, but then retrieving it uh, again depends. If you use an on ramp that has really nice caching for you and solves it for you, great. Like so, things like Web3 storage and FCO storage and so on um, all work really well. Um, if you manually give a ton of data to storage providers, then retrieval is harder. And that's one of the areas where these retrieval networks are coming in to, uh, to help solve the problem. Um, so that's what uh, retrieval networks and retrieval markets are aiming for on the order of 100,000 to 10 million nodes. Um, and we're kind of thinking of like being able to deal with 10 to the 18 objects. That's kind of web, that's web scale. Maybe 10 to the 15 is good enough, but 10 to the 18 is like um, safe territory. Um, and these will likely end up being um, tiered. So there's a, one of these is called Saturn, um, and it has a, a set of tiers where the virtual client may be running a service worker um, locally in the, in the browser node um, that talks to an L1, which is primarily a bandwidth-oriented cache layer. That L1 talks to an L2. The L2 might have a bunch of content that was positioned there ahead of time predicting that the data was gonna be, is going to be requested in a region. Um, and then if the, all of those fail, or the L1 might just go straight to L3, which is the, the SP. So think of like standard style, system style caching, um, but, a, but it, per region. And so, so think of these as being deployed um, in, in a locale so that you minimize the, the, the um, latency. You, you don't wanna be crossing continents here. You wanna be um, retrieving data from within, uh, ideally closest data centers and so on. Um, yeah, you'll, you'll hear a lot more about indexers and uh, basically out of time. And on computation, yeah, this is going to be super interesting for a ton of IPFS implementations because this means you have a massive scale data repository on wh where you can dump a bunch of data in and then run a bunch of data pipelines and computation uh, to then build other kinds of applications. Uh, so we, you know, all this stuff can take like large archives of all the crypt trees from like all the applications and just be this like. Um, cold storage of all the stuff, and then whatever you want to pin, you get close to the to the end users, and you keep like the local hot caches for every, everything um, closer to wherever the person is. Uh, cool, that's it.